which was 12 hours without food and water. I wanted to let the Muslims know that there is a, a bed sheet outside in, in case you want to pray. Uh, so you can do that, and iftar will be downstairs. So with that said, and I normally don't use paper or I'm gonna I'm gonna say my name, but um, I just need this right now. Okay. I begin my testimony with the name of God, the most gracious, the most... Excuse me, just for a record, your name and address? It's coming. I didn't start your time. Okay, okay. Mr. President, aldermen and older women, and guests, greetings of peace, and blessed Ramadan to those of I shine. My name is Sohir Omer, 44 Sharon Road. I grew up in Waterbury. I am an alumna of the Waterbury Public School. I see the Zimmerman's here too. You as well. Oh, no, you didn't go. Your wife did. I'm a director of institutional research and a statistics lecturer at Connecticut State Community College. Hello, Bilal, my colleague, at Naugatuck Valley here in, Naug uh, in Waterbury. I'm here to address you all on the most recent Israel and Palestine conflict, which has been horrifying and unconscionable to witness. You heard the statistics, over 1,200 Israelis and over 30,000 Palestinians. Innocent lives have died. And 70% of them were women and children. 70% women and children. Even more disturbing is the fact that this conflict is mostly funded by our hard-earned tax dollars. According to USA Facts, the United States sent Israel $3.3 billion in fiscal year 2023, 99% of which went to IDF, the Israeli military. Meanwhile, meanwhile, one-fifth, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, one-fifth of the residents of Waterbury live below the poverty line. That's unacceptable. And the largest demographic, racial or ethnic group that lives below the poverty line is white, followed by Hispanic and Latin and black and African American. Why are we sending our tax dollars overseas to kill innocent babies boys and girls, instead of uplifting the residents of Waterbury out of poverty. I teach statistics. Do you know that the students at our community college, nearly half of them, aren't ready for college level math? Half my class can't round numbers correctly. Instead of funding the Foreign, affair, foreign military financing program, we should be increasing the funding for early college opportunity programs such as Gear Up and Upward Bound. We should be investing more in public education. We should be investing more in workforce development. I know someone was here from workforce investment. It, it's it's mind-boggling. and. You know, why do we come to you? Why do we come to our city council? You know why? Because our representatives in Washington, D.C. aren't listening to us. The U.S. President, the U.S. Ambassador to the U.N., and our Connecticut congressional delegation, and I'm looking at the camera because I want them to hear this, they're not listening to us. We went to them before we came here. So we, as concerned citizens, are coming to you, our local leaders, to say, please, make a formal statement to the U.S. government to say, stop sending our tax dollars overseas to fuel death and destruction, and invest those monies, reallocate those funds to American cities, including the city of Waterbury. So we urge you to place the ceasefire resolution on your agenda. This is an opportunity for you to speak up against injustice. My brother here invoked Dr. Martin Luther King. What did he say? Everyone knows this quote. 
He said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Isn't that right? Yes. This is a moral crisis, and we must rise to it. So again, we urge you to place a ceasefire resolution on your agenda and to pass it. I'm going to conclude my remarks by quoting Aaron Bushnell. He was a U.S. serviceman, may God have mercy on his soul, who set himself on fire outside the Israeli embassy two weeks ago. He said, quote, my name is Aaron Bushnell. I'm an active duty member of the U.S. Armed Forces, and I will no longer be complicit in genocide. He said, I'm sorry, my fast, and I'm also getting- Ms. Steps, I would be, go ahead and finish, yeah, okay? I'm gonna finish it. He said that I'm about to engage in an extreme act of protest, but compared to what the Palestinian people are experiencing at the hands of their colonizers, this is an extreme at all. This is what our ruling class decided will be normal. Free Palestine. Yes. End quote. Thank you. Next speaker from 26 Seymour Street, Evelyn Gonzalez. Good evening, board uh, members. My name is Ephraim Gonzalez, 26 Seymour Street. I'm here tonight also in support of this uh, ceasefire uh, resolution. I would or, uh, urge all the war members to put it on the agenda at least and talk about this, you know. Uh, that's one issue. The, uh, the other issue that I'm here about is six months ago, I was here under the previous administration and I addressed the issue of crime on the area where I live, uh, 26 Seymour Street. That, uh, that area down there is affected uh, very hard with drug activity. I've been working, I've been trying to work very hard with the police department, but the police department got tired of me already, and they don't even answer to, the, uh, they don't even answer to, the, uh, to my phone calls no more. But that's okay, I decided to go a step ahead of them. I went to the state police, I gave the complaint to the state police. I'm going to see what the state police is going to do about this matter. Uh, and also, I'm also contemplating on uh, uh, suing the city of Waterbury for uh, uh, this you know, situation that's going on over here of me addressing the issue to the Waterbury APD. And the Waterbury APD, it goes in one ear and out the other ear. So those are, uh, 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 that, that's an issue that, you know, I'm, uh, I'm contemplating on doing. I have tried to call the uh, chief of police. I left messages, nothing, nothing. Uh, I talked to the secretary, Charlotte. Anyway, so those are two issues that are, you know, concerning here tonight. And I want all of you people to, you know, listen to this carefully. The, uh, the, cease, uh, the ceasefire has to be addressed. I don't know exactly what the city is able to do because this is more of a, of a, a international deal. But if there is funding uh, that might affect uh, the city of Waterbury because of this uh, ceasefire not taking place, I would sure like for all the board members to look into this and place it on the agenda and you know work with this. Uh, the other issue is going back to Sacred Heart. I spoke before on the deal. Many people spoke. I heard a lot of people uh, pros and I heard a lot of cons. Uh, again, I am a lifelong citizen of the, uh, uh, citizen of, of Waterbury. I've been all my life here. I was born in Puerto Rico, but I came a year and a half. I graduated to all the schools there and everything. So going back to Sacred Heart, like Larry McPhil was saying, nobody is knocking their project. I think they have they have some good ideas. I think that, that they want to help people. I think, you know, I think the project is good. I just don't agree with the way the way uh, the way this came upon. Now, Larry DePillo has a, a very excellent point on, on, on 
and Tony, I myself, I myself uh, had purchased a grocery store about six or seven month ago, I went to the zoning board just to get a, 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 a beer license, a grocery, not, and the zoning board gave me a hard time, gave me a hard time. So now, why, why is the zoning board uh, taking preference to, to the city and, and not to other people? That I don't understand. I don't understand it. That zoning area over there is zoned for a certain way, then somebody else wants to come and rezone it again. It cannot be done. It cannot be done. So that, it doesn't make sense. One minute. It doesn't make sense. So anyway, and by the way, to this conclusion here is, don't think that Ephraim, Ephraim has died. I'm still around. Just because I'm retired, but when, when you know, certain things come upon, I will come and speak. Thank you very much. Next speaker from 41 Wind Glen Drive, Faiz Speed. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Faiz Saeed, 41 Wind Glen Drive. Uh, what I said in Arabic is, in the name of God, the most greatest, the most merciful, I come to you in peace. I come for you to save my children. If we were Palestinians, we would have been slaughtered. If I went to Palestine, we would have been murdered. Nothing more, nothing less. We're Yemenis, but our blood is Palestinian. From across the border, I went there. They treated me like an animal. Just because I was a Muslim and a well-known activist. And by the way, most of my work and all of my work is nothing but peace. We don't need a whole law enforcement, nothing more. I can control my people more than the whole police force, just like I did in Harvard. I'm just putting that out there. I'm someone who cares for all people and someone who calls for peace. We heard some statements about civil rights leaders like Malcolm X or Nelson Mandela. Back in the 60s, they talked about the freedom of Palestinians, including Dr. King, Malcolm X, who said that Palestine should have their land. And now we, we're coming because we feel that we're oppressed, that we are second-class citizens. In 2016, I led the largest protest in Connecticut for the Democratic Party. And I'm not saying I'm for the Democratic Party or against the Republican Party. Not at all. But we put the work in. And I was the lead activist, not only in Connecticut, but throughout this country. And we, we won that election. And now hardcore people within the leadership are coming back to me and telling me, do it again. But our people are being slaughtered. Our people are being killed. How is that acceptable? One side is trying to ban us, and the other side is trying to kill us. We want freedom. We want to be treated like humans. We want to stop being killed. Free Palestine. Next speaker, please. Um, 12 Valentino Drive. My minds and fresh dreams. Our world was shaken by the horrific events of that day, and we continue to hold those children and their families in our hearts as we advocate for gun reform in this nation. Fast forward to 2024. Over 12,300 children have been murdered in Gaza within 156 days. The World Health Organization Director General Gabrasis told the UN Security Council, nowhere and no one is safe. The UN describes the Gaza Strip as a graveyard for children. A child is killed on average every 10 minutes in the Gaza Strip, from infants to 17-year-olds. 75% hadn't even lived to their teens. 17-year-olds lived through four wars only to be killed in the fifth. And 10-year-olds had their lives ended before adolescence. While five-year-olds 
four-year-olds were deprived of the joys of preschool and a soul-shattering number of babies didn't even reach their first birthday. As of today, at least 21 children have died of malnutrition as AIDS sits just kilometers away, blocked by the Israeli government and its citizens from reaching children who are withering away into corpses before they've even died. UNICEF has estimated that more than a thousand children in Gaza have had one or both of their legs amputated within these last 156 days. UNICEF reports that at least 17,000 children in Gaza are unaccompanied or separated, each one a heartbreaking story of loss and grief. Please tell me, what goes on in a child's head and heart when they're pulled out from under their rubble after days without food or water? Watching their family members be torn limb from limb, realizing that their friends and classmates are no longer on this earth with them. When they are able to run and play one day and are wheelchair bound the next, losing both their parents who are supposed to protect them and care for them, be forced to grow up and provide for their younger siblings with the harrowing weight of survival crushing them from atop their shoulders. What goes on in a child's heart and head? The reason I brought up Sandy Hook at the beginning of this testimony is because we as Connecticut residents, having experienced the trauma and everlasting impact of the tragedy at Sandy Hook with the loss of such precious, innocent lives at the hands of senseless violence, we as a state should be at the forefront calling for an immediate and permanent ceasefire in Gaza. Nothing, nothing will ever justify the murder of one innocent child, more so 12,300 innocent children. How can we sit here silently and say we value the lives of children when we know our tax dollars are being used to drop bombs on innocent Palestinians? And I want to make it very clear that calling for a permanent ceasefire does not negate accountability or application of international law, including the return of hostages. That all comes after. Calling for a humanitarian pause or a six-week ceasefire is the epitome of hypocrisy, visualized in real time as the U.S. funds both the bombs and meager humanitarian aid being dropped in Gaza simultaneously. No child should ever look up to the sky and wonder if what's falling is bombs or bread. You might think, well, what's the point of Waterbury calling for a ceasefire? I've been a Waterbury resident since I first came to this country at four years old. And what I love most about this place is its diversity, cultural and religious vibrancy, and the way we always show up for one another. One minute, Miss. Waterbury residents want to stand on the right side of history alongside residents of Windsor, Bridgeport, and Hampton. We don't want any more blood on our hands. So as our representatives, represent us. If our senators in D.C. don't want to listen to us and we can't make change from the top down, we must go from the bottom up. If Waterbury joins the other towns in calling for a permanent ceasefire, we pressure the state and eventually we pressure the nation. What will be your legacy, Representative Hayes, and everyone here right now? What will you tell your grandchildren? Because we won't forget what happened and continues to happen in Gaza. Everything is well documented. The genocide is being televised right before our eyes. We as human beings with a conscience and morals refuse to be complicit in this genocide. We refuse to sit silently as children are slaughtered. That is not radical or extreme. That is human. Being silent whilst this genocide unfolds is what is radical and extreme. We demand that you put a ceasefire resolution on the agenda and call for a permanent ceasefire. Thank you. Waterbury for a while. 
I want to just say thank you for the Bristol Babcock signs, but there's much more to do. MVP still is awaiting information on the ordinance, what's happening with that, with the signs and the fencing. And I would hope that we would get an answer. I would ask that as the Charter Revision Committee is doing its work, that residents be invited to have input, that residents be advised, and that we get to see what's happening. And I say this specifically with good examples. I volunteered with the commission in town for eight years. And that commission acted appropriately for six and a half to seven of those years. When things changed, I will go through the things that happened that are not on the ordinance. And there are things that worry me about people being put on boards and commissions. As many times as the question has been asked, how are these people vetted, we still don't know. At the first meeting with three new commissioners, none of them had read the ordinance, none of them had read the charter, no one knew what that commission was about. That is worrisome to this board, it is worrisome to this city, it is worrisome to our residents. They should not step up and take that position without knowing what they're doing, how they're doing it, and what their responsibilities are. I went to the first meeting, I'm not gonna repeat my story there, but I will tell you that a person who was on another commission allowed to take an executive position on this commission as well as another one that is against the ordinances and the commission to charter you can't do that you can be an executive on one group, not two i think that it's very difficult when we do this in january you people voted on a member for the commission who had resigned in 2023 what does that do to the quorum? That pretty much negates it. Another person on the commission, if that commissioner was not called, I'm going to say I'm very hesitant that that person would be able to continue because of transportation and health. Do people talk to the old commissioners, the veterans, and say, hey, are you going to do this? Or are they just appointed in the blind? We need commissions that work. That's what they're here to do. They're here to follow their ordinance. And for someone to say, we're not going to do anything that's difficult, we're just going to take an easy path. That's not what government is about. We don't take the easy path. We take the path that's right. And I'm concerned that we're not doing that. Next step. Thank you to Kevin Zach. I don't know how many of you saw the article today, but he is applauded for his work on the Naugatuck River. He has saved it over and over again. I do have a concern. The co-dam apparently is in danger of breach. I believe the Naugatuck Valley Council of Government is working on that issue. But I have an issue to share. In the, I believe it was One minute. I believe it was the 55 flood. On that river, at that flood, my husband's family lost everything. And I mean everything. As we're taking down dams, I implore this board to look into what are we doing to protect the river now? Because that's not going to change. If we take out all the dams, the water will flow faster. And we know we are in a problem with climate change. I had 13 inches of rain in one week, and I believe I had five or six last week. We are getting to some really concerning levels. And I would ask that you look into that to protect our safety. As far as property goes that the city takes over, my next request is that when we look at taking over a property, it's not just money. Revenue is important. But if we don't have the funds in this city to support our first responders, our police department, and our people, what are we doing adding more buildings that in 10 years will be nothing but another brown? That's that. Please take into account these things, and hopefully we can do better. Next speaker from 97 Idlewood Avenue, J. Wad Ashram.
last speaker here, uh, the first gentleman uh, spoke to what was editorial, which when I read, um, almost shocked me. Uh, I'm confused how some of these people here, I don't know everybody here, but some of the names, when I went to the voting about it, I remember looking at these names, and I was able to pick. And these are supposed to be our speakers, which represent our voice. And I was surprised to listen to this editorial that we can't even get words together. We can't even get like a resolution to be debated. That's a concern for me. Whether you go one way or the other, but you don't want to debate on it, that's a concern for me. That prompted me to write an editorial in response, and it got published. I don't know if you read the response. I'm going to read that right now. That's what I'm going to do with my time. Aaron Bushnell, 25 year old active duty special weapon, service man in the Air Force, and the ultimate form of protest, set himself on fire to make not only a political point, but a moral point. One may question, why go that far? The piercing question that should be asked are, what were the conditions of society that would compel such a form of protest? This is not the first time that self demolition has occurred to protest wars that directly affect every state, every city in this nation. Perhaps the most famous one was that of Norman Morrison in 1965 to protest the Vietnam War right under the office of Secretary of Defense Robert McNamara, who later wrote in his memoirs that it was a significant turning point for him. Sometimes society becomes complicit, and often due to lack of adequate coverage, it loses its moral core. Often it takes an extreme act of protest that symbolizes the magnitude of the moral depravity and suffering to bring the focus back onto our moral core. With this color in the background, it's sad to hear that our elected officials are shying away from even words of concern for the most documented genocide of our times, unraveling right in our living room. This never happened before. With this color in the background, it's sad to hear that our elected officials are shying away from even the words of concern for the most documented genocide of our times. If we do not have moral fortitude to even speak against an extreme form of injustice, that is something we need to address. Lastly, we elect our leadership. They serve us and represent our voice in spaces and problems that we, the people, do not have easy access to. Nearly 80% of Americans would like to see a ceasefire. Waterbury has a significant Muslim population, but it's not only the Muslim demographics. It's not only the Muslim demographics. We should not minimize the reality of young Jewish and black Americans and young Americans in general who are all united calling for a ceasefire. Some of the most powerful forms of protest as citizens have come from Jewish organizations. One minute. We call upon our leadership to represent our voice and join other townships in Connecticut all across America to do the same. We elect representatives to voice our concern. If they shy away from that basic obligation, then we organize to ensure that the ones we elect do. As a Waterbury resident, I need to hear my voice augmented from my elected leadership. Hamas should return all 130 Israeli hostages. Israel should return 9,000 Palestinian hostages. There should be an immediate ceasefire and discussion to achieve peace through a two-state solution, the stated policy of the United States. That which we owe to Aaron Bushnell, who sacrificed his life for the soul of his country. And I would like to state, if you will permit me, I want to take 25 seconds to honor the memory of Aaron Bushnell, a real American hero who has not been honored as such, who has been maligned. So I want to take 25 seconds to honor his memory in silence.
Best times for good year.